Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Kaylee McDevitt. She's a registered dietitian specializing in nutrition for women's health. And today we're going to be talking about minerals and the role that minerals play in balancing hormones, in energy, in thyroid metabolism, and metabolism in general. This is a fun podcast, and we geek out on hormones big time. So you're definitely going to learn something in this podcast. So let's introduce you to Kaylee McDevitt. Hey, health junkies, I have Kaylee McDevitt on, and we're going to be talking about food. We're going to be talking about minerals. We're going to be talking about all the things that we kind of overlook when it comes to the basics of helping you balance your hormones, health, life in general. So Kaylee, welcome to Health Fix Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm pumped to be here. Well, gosh, you know, before I hit record, I kind of was like, um, you kind of do all the things I need help with in my practice, you know, <laughs> all the things that we're working on with patients and and you've got kind of the foundation. And sometimes, you know, as docs, it's hard for us to do that underlying coaching. And, and this is where I love looking to RDs that are, let's say, awake to <laughs> what's legit nutrition. So, of course, I always have to ask, you know, you went to the traditional schooling. I saw that in your, your um, website about your history. And then you were like, oh, wait. I, then I'm missing something. Give us kind of the backstory in terms of how that evolution came out. And were you always nu- interested in nutrition as a kid? Yeah, you know, I, I knew I would do something in the health space. My mom was a physical therapist. I was an athlete. I was like, you know, it'll be something in that space. And mm-hmm. I think I maybe was a sophomore in undergrad when I realized that dietetics was a thing that I could pursue. And it fit perfectly for me at the time because I was obsessed with reading how to use food and exercise to manipulate how you looked. So Mm -hmm. I was like, cool, I'm going to learn all the tricks from this program. I'm going to be an expert at this. And so I, you know, moved into the dietetic space. I was thinking I'd be a sports dietitian because that's kind of what I was interested in at the time. And as luck would have it, I was dealing with a whole bunch of hormone health issues throughout the years that I was in school. So my undergrad, grad school, and then getting ready for my boards after the internship. And a lot of this comes back to being put on birth control quite young, which I'm sure we could discuss too. Oh yeah. But uh, I was like gold star, like straight A type student. So I am meticulously applying all the nutrition information I'm being taught to a T and feeling worse and worse as years go on. So I graduate, I get a credential and I feel horrible. And I'm like, great, I am completely unprepared to help people. (laughs) And, uh, you know, while I have no regrets for the, the path that took me here, and I think even the conventional education was huge in like the biochemistry and anatomy and physiology understanding, great. Um, I realized that I did not understand how the female body worked. I did not understand hormones. And I definitely did not understand how nutrition really should be applied in the context of women's health. And so I spent a lot of my first years as an RD, not working in women's health, but spending all my free time trying to learn the stuff that I didn't learn and realizing, holy crap, this nutrition advice that I've been following is not moving me in the right direction. So yeah, I had a health, a health awakening and kind of completely pivoted away from the conventional nutrition and um, ended up sharing this process as a blog at first and eventually got back to feeling really amazing myself and then realized a lot of other women were looking for that info too. So moved to private practice in women's health and have loved being here because it's such an underserved segment of the population when it comes to nutrition research. Yeah. Yeah. I have to agree with you because I mean, we, unfortunately for women, we're, we're susceptible, right. To trends, fads, what's a quick fix, things of that nature. And, you know, watching our moms, right. Depending Mm -hmm. on how moms are. I mean, I, I started dieting at at eight years old when I saw my mom, Mm -hmm you know, dieting. And so I thought, well, oh, this is the way to do it. But really, we're looking at we were looking at this guru, that guru. Now, mm-hmm. one of the big things that that we you had mentioned is is birth control. And mm. I think a lot of women start even their journey as a woman as they go through puberty, kind of messed up when it comes to hormone balance and, and the things we need, like the nutrients, the vitamins and minerals. So I would love to hear you kind of chat a little bit about like, what did you learn about birth control and how can we help younger women right now or women who are yeah. listening and have grandkids or have, you know, children that are on birth control? How can we support them and tell them what might be happening right now? 
Yeah, this is such a passion area of mine because it was just, it was the thing that rocked my world health wise and kind of started me down this trajectory. But, um, you know, personally, I went on birth control almost immediately after starting to have a period because my symptoms were so horrible. I was missing days of school, I was missing practice. And at the time, it was like, hey, here's this that you can take and it'll solve all those problems. And I was like, immediately, yes, that sounds perfect. And the problem with going on it so young is that I likely hadn't established really great brain to ovary communication yet. I hadn't established really strong progesterone production yet. And if we look at causes for most of our miserable period symptoms, it is typically that we have too much estrogen and not enough progesterone around, which is definitely the state that I was in. And choosing to go to birth control at that time meant I never investigated ways to resolve that problem for real. And I spent about a decade on birth control, trying a bunch of different types because I was dealing with a lot of symptoms. And, um, when I eventually did come off of it, lo and behold, that original issue was very much still there. (laughs) Uh, It does not solve that problem. And what I learned in my digging is that it also created a whole bunch of nutrient deficiencies for me which I saw um, like on paper when I did some micronutrient testing on myself around that time, it puts a lot of stress on the microbiome, the liver and the gallbladder. And then it has a completely different impact on your physiology when we're using synthetic hormones versus naturally made ones. So for me, that manifested with really significant anxiety and mood swings, very low energy and just low drive for life. Just really feeling like I was a dulled version of who I used to be. Um, all of those things absolutely can be repaired, but I think the conversation starts at a young age about here's how the menstrual cycle works. And if we have symptoms, that's our body's way of communicating with us. And guess what? We've got some tools that we can use to try to mitigate those issues earlier on, rather than putting a big old bandaid with some additional risks involved in it on top of it. You know, I think it's valuable to talk about this really early on because you know, by the time I see women, we're looking at 30 plus years of being on birth control yep. if they didn't stop to to have kids or I'm looking at women who stop and then they're like, OK, now I want to get pregnant. And it's like we got to go back to when you first started because now we've just masked things. So what are some of the what are some of the minerals you saw with yourself, vitamins, you know, give us the backstory on you, like kind of with those really painful, heavy periods, because that's what I hear, you know, not too many people are getting birth control just for the fun of it. It's because yeah. life is difficult without and especially athletes. Mm-hmm. I would agree. Yeah. Give yeah. us a, that story. Like, what did you find was deficient, you know, with your micronutrient and things of that nature? Yeah. Yeah. I was working in corporate wellness at the time. It was the first job I had as an RD and we did um, surprisingly like functional labs for our corporate clients. So we were doing tons of micronutrient testing, which was really cool for me as a baby dietitian at the time. And so I got the opportunity to run them on myself Mm -hmm. thinking this is going to be like the best looking micronutrient panel anyone's ever seen. And it came back with deficiencies, like really across the board. So it was Mm -hmm. like the whole B complex section of vitamins, which Again, our somewhat limited research on birth control and micronutrient status shows us that B vitamins tend to be depleted. Mm -hmm. We tend to see a big hit on our antioxidants. So thinking about like vitamin C, E, selenium, and then minerals like zinc and magnesium and even copper can be influenced by birth control. And I definitely saw all of those land for me. Um, I think probably to a T that entire list was deficient on on my testing at the time. And uh, yeah, I mean, if we want to look at reasons why we might not feel good, why we might have mood swings, or we might have low energy or met- metabolic issues, I mean, look no further. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the B vitamins alone are like so key for, for making hormones and detoxing hormones as well. What mm-hmm. micronutrient tests did you have back then? And, you know, because I love, I, I see that you teach folks how to read tests. So mm-hmm. yeah. I, I'd love to share on what you're using and, and what you had back then. And yeah, back then we were using SpectraCell's micronutrient mm-hmm. test. Um, it was relatively new at the time. It was pretty unique that it was looking at lymphocytes, so a bigger, longer-term picture of, of nutrient status, and then a much bigger panel versus the types of nutrients that would be tested on general lab work. Um, we don't do much of that type of testing in practice now. We've moved to looking at minerals specifically, so we'll use um, HTMAs or hair tissue mineral analysis. And I know we'll talk minerals and we'll talk about why that's our starting point now. It's also a really cost-effective tool when we contrast that with micronutrient testing. But there's absolutely 
some value in, in specialty micronutrient testing if we want to get a really expanded picture of vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. The, you know, a lot of people will knock the hair tissue mineral analysis, but that's the thing, you know, it is cost effective. And and one of the, the things that I find cost prohibitive for folks is the testing can be really mm-hmm. expensive. And so, especially my younger crew, you know, folks in their twenties, you know, just getting started in life. And now they've, you know, I'm not shelling out 350 or more for, you right. know, a micronutrient <laughs> or a nutrient eval, right. You know, I don't blame them. So, you know, those kind of things I think can be incredibly helpful. So I think my next question would be just kind of going along the lines of your practice. You're talking about the minerals. You already hinted it. I'm like, I can't hold back. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us why you start with minerals. What's what's What have you found? Yeah. So if we're looking at really anything someone would be coming to either of our practices for, whether it's cycle related fertility, maybe they're in the perimenopause timeframe and not feeling great, or this is a general like low energy, low metabolic state type picture, we're really talking about energy and we can't resolve really any health condition if we can't make great energy at the cellular level. So if we really think about what minerals do in the body, they're cofactors for all of our enzyme function, which means nothing happens in the cell in a mineral deficient state, whether that's energy production, detoxification, it's getting nutrients and fuel or even hormones interacting with the cells themselves. And so we ended up stumbling into using HTMA testing because we were trying to figure out why certain clients got better so quickly and others didn't, and why some people stayed better and others kind of came right back into their same symptoms. And our belief is that it comes down to mineral status because that's our energy and that's our stress resilience. And we've got so much stress as modern humans, as modern women, that if we don't have a really robust mineral store, we just get knocked down by that stress. And then we see energy levels just ratchet down as a result. So what we found is if we start by looking at minerals, cost-effective, yay, simple, also yay. And the interventions are so simple as well. It's primarily like food and beverage based we can get really quick wins on some of those initial symptoms and things last a lot longer. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. And so, you know, I think a lot of people might be like, okay, minerals, what are the most common deficient (laughs) minerals that you find related to hormone health? So the first four minerals that we would consider like foundational or tier one are calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium. And we see a lot of deficiency really across the board in that section of the pattern on an HTMA is called a four lows pattern. And this is the burnt out woman. This is, we probably had really stressful years where we were running a million miles an hour and burning the candle at both ends. And now we have like come screeching to a halt and the wheels have fallen off. Um, That is a very common state for clients to embark on their work with us. I would assume you probably see some burnt out high achieving women as well. <laughs> just a few, just yeah. a few. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's a really big one. And then the other most common pattern that we see in the clients we serve is actually an imbalance between calcium and potassium. And that really influences cellular thyroid function. So how well can we get that active T3 thyroid hormone actually into the cell? And what's cool about that is it solves a lot of mysteries for the clients that have textbook hypothyroid symptoms, but their blood work looks okay. Yep. So they're making it, they're converting it, but Hey, it's not actually getting to the cells. So we're still going to feel that deficiency. So a lot of just like hypo metabolic state type clients, fatigue, weight loss, resistance, loss of libido and drive for life, typically some cycle symptoms with that too. Um, so I'd say that's kind of the other main class of women that we serve. It's like, burnt out high achievers, and then low energy, just hypometabolic state. Very common. I would agree. That's kind of my, I, w- I would say that's my practice too. Yeah. Okay. A pretty good juggle between, between the two. And, you know, yes, sometimes there's folks in between. So if those of you mm-hmm. are listening, you're like, I don't really fit either one. Don't worry. We'll find you. Um, <laughs> you're somewhere in between. Now you go about it, you go, okay, we've got that, you know, those base minerals. Okay, we go through that. You get to working on those. And then from there with mineral supplementation, what's the next step? Because you were saying food. I'm saying supplementation as I'm saying it out loud, but you were saying food. And you and I had talked about the adrenal cocktail mm-hmm. and how that was like magic. So tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about like food to help support the minerals yeah. and then if that's not doing the trick supplementation. Yeah. So starting with, again, those first four, which we would spend at least a month just hanging out with those before we would go any further with additional minerals. 
Um, we're looking at first and foremost, just getting a quality mineral rich salt into your diet, which is one of the many things that if like baby dietitian me could ever hear me recommending more salt to people, she would have uh, lost it, but we need mineral rich salt. So salt that hasn't been stripped of all its trace minerals. So we're looking at things like Redmond's real salt or Celtic sea salt. Um, Crucial four is a great brand as well, or just any unrefined evaporated salt that you can find at the store. So nature did the evaporation. We didn't chemically extract things. And actually adding some salt at meals, maybe a pinch to our water. I think the last couple of decades, we had a lot of push around just like chugging mass quantities of water throughout the day, Mm -hmm. carrying those gallon jugs around. And we were really just peeing all the time and further depleting the mineral situation. And if we can just add a little salt back, um, food tastes better. We hang on to that water better in our cells. And we typically aren't waking up to pee three or four times because we're drinking so much plain water. Um, So that's a nice starting point. And you can see a big return on energy with just a little extra sodium coming in because we're, you know, now we're digesting food better. I mean, there's a lot that comes from that sodium. And then potassium would be another big one for energy wins. And again, looking back to the last couple of decades of just nutrition, diet dogma, uh, we had a lot of like carb fearing and carb eliminating going on. Mm -hmm. And if we look at food sources of potassium, it's primarily fruit and root vegetables. And those were two like demons (laughs) during the low carb phase. So it might mean bringing some of those back in and seeing how we feel. Um, If blood sugar concerns are in the mix, we might look at making sure that's coming with protein and fat in a meal. Or maybe we look to a beverage like coconut water, as an example, or aloe vera juice, or any of the um, mineral or electrolyte powders on the market that are pretty high uh, potassium, but not coming with a whole bunch of sugar with it. Mm -hmm. Um, Which I know when we were talking about the adrenal cocktail, (laughs) that's um, an unflavored zero sugar powder that is sodium, potassium, and vitamin C and can make that really easy. Um, You certainly can DIY this. You do not need to buy a product for that. But if you're on the go or we need one last thing on the to-do list, a powder like that is nice and easy. I agree. I, that's my go-to. And then of course we, the DIY, everybody that's been in my practice for a while is like, yeah, okay. I know I need to be doing that (laughs) on repeat, on repeat. So as you know, you had mentioned the, the hypometabolic folks and you're talking about potassium, Mm -hmm. you're talking about calcium, you know, there's a lot of press out there on calcium, good calcium, bad calcium, Mm -hmm. you know, can you speak a little bit to how you describe calcium being used, how you use the calcium, how you help folks understand that connection for helping yeah. the hypometabolic states? Sure. So calcium is obviously important. And like everything else in the body, it's a Goldilocks situation. If we have too much calcium where it doesn't belong, like in the vasculature and the tissues, we can have risk of, of cardiovascular issues, or we start to see it messing with hormone signaling, like the thyroid, like we discussed at the cellular level, mm-hmm. but too little calcium does not feel good either. Um, calcium and magnesium are more calming, soothing, sedating type minerals, whereas sodium and potassium are more energizing. So if we lack calcium, it feels like struggling to get out of the fight or flight state. It feels like a racing mind at the end of the day, when you're trying to wind down, Um, We can even see more allergies in a low calcium state as well. So it's not a matter of dropping calcium in the tissues. We want a sweet spot there. And where I see a lot of mismanagement of calcium is we do a ton of like pretty blind supplementation of of calcium, especially in women, Mm -hmm. because we're trying to preserve bone health, but nothing in the body happens in isolation. And it's never about just one mineral or one nutrient. Calcium is part of a bigger matrix that influences bone health. And if we just give supplemental calcium without any regard to where it's actually going, we can actually cause some problems in our clients. Because if it's going to the tissues or hanging out in the vasculature rather than the bones and teeth, it's not only not serving us, but it's posing some risk. So that means we have to zoom out and look at things like magnesium status and calcium to phosphorus ratios. Even our vitamin A can influence this. Our vitamin D status influences this. Um, and then of course it's relationship to potassium is big too. And things like K2 can also be really helpful at moving calcium to the bones and teeth and making sure that if we are increasing calcium intake through food or supplementation, it's actually getting instruction on where to go to be beneficial. Um, so that's something that comes up a lot in practice would imagine it does for you too, with the population that you serve for this, like osteoporosis prevention is just 
a whole lot of calcium supplementation with no regard for where it is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, there's the standard, like you have to get in 1500 milligrams, you know, and it's like, okay, that's it. Like we, what about the rest of the protocol? Right. You know, <laughs> so oftentimes, you know, I'm going to be doing similar things as you are looking at the the minerals and, and vitamins and go, all right, like where's baseline here? Where's, where's step one. So moving into say that's tier one, tier two, where do you go next? You've got the minerals balanced. People are feeling better. Now what, what do we look at next? Yeah. So now we might look at some of the like secondary or tertiary minerals, which would be things like copper, zinc, and iron and their relationship with one another. We might look at things like boron and sulfur on an HTMA test to help with the way we manage and move things like iron and protect our bones and also our detox capacity in the liver. Mm -hmm. And then what's also really fun on HTMA testing is the mineral ratios, um, which again is taking kind of abstract mineral information and making it applicable to different body systems. So we talked about the thyroid one with calcium to potassium, but now we might look at an adrenal or stress ratio. We might look at how resilient are we to stress ratio. We might look at blood sugar ratios to see, are we more prone to hyper or hypoglycemia and can start to get a, a deeper, bigger picture on what's going on in this client's physiology. And then we can get more specific again with food, with mineral beverages or even supplementation at that point. Gotcha. Gotcha. So a lot of times, you know, folks come to me and there, there's multiple different hair tissue mineral analysis mm. out there, right? You can buy them on Amazon. Even, even to <laughs> I this day. didn't even know that. <laughs> yeah. I, I discovered it the other day. I, I was surprised. There's like a lot of the same labs I used to like doctor's data and stuff. There, there's yeah. a lot of labs that sell online now. I'm like, oh, wow. So you know, of course I want to hone in on what type of testing that you're using, what brand and, and kind of give us, a, give us a little bit of the background. Cause those ratios are something that I haven't seen on all the different tests. Yeah. Cause a lot of patients will come in and hand me what they've done before or on their own. Yeah, I know. And that's probably one of the trickier things is that, you know, different lab companies are going to have different methodology, different ranges and different presentation on reports. And you can't necessarily read them all the same way. Um, I think they could all be useful. We just have to know which one we're looking at and how that's being reported. Hey, health junkies, Jake and Steph from Troop Functional Mushrooms have given you a little gift for listening to this podcast. If you enter Health Fix 20, you can get 20% off your order of Troop Functional Mushrooms. All right, let's get back to the podcast. Um, we use trace elements for yeah. HTMA testing. They're here in Texas too. Um, and their methodology is the same as analytical research labs out in Arizona. So either of those would be fairly comparable in terms of how we read it, the ratio presentation, um, even the ranges will have a slight difference between lab to lab. But I really like those two companies because they do not wash the hair sample when it comes into the lab. Oh, and the idea behind not washing it is that if we look at the studies where they do wash it, it doesn't just strip things that we don't want to see. It seems to really influence actually the like mineral composition of the hair that would be on the report and drop some of those markers. So I will say there is no perfect or flawless way to do this. And I would say that about any lab, you know, there's a lot of uh, user error that's potential for this. And if you think about a hair collection, the water that is being used for the shower, the shampoo, all of that stuff matters. Um, so there's some variables to help mitigate risk of an unreliable report, but I really like the methodology of those two. Okay. Yeah. One of the things I've heard, and this is something I'd love for you to help me understand, because it isn't something I've spent a lot of time diving into, is, is what kind of things can you see on a hair mineral analysis if you know that it's maybe the water that the yeah. per like they don't have filtered water. They live in the middle of nowhere. I don't know. I, I live on a farm. Mm -hmm. So oh, I love it. <laughs> we have, we have well water, right? So who knows um, what kind of things could be in the water at, at in certain people's homes. Right. Yeah. So my question is like, ha can you tell, is there like a thing that's like flags on these labs mm -hmm. that say might be water? Yeah. yeah. One of the most common ones is um, in places that have hard water, which Texas is definitely one of those places. We have extraordinarily hard water. You will see really high calcium on an HTMA if we haven't done something to mitigate that calcium okay. exposure. Okay. Um, if somebody has a lot of um, like copper leaching into their water supply. So that seems to be more in like 
older cities or older homes where they're maybe farther down on the water line with old copper pipes, we might see a falsely elevated high copper. Um, we'll see some heavy metal contamination depending on the location as well. Um, uranium is a really common one that's just coming from where people are geographically because there's different areas that have more uranium in the soil and therefore in the water. And then the last thing that'll sometimes be skewed is if someone's using a water softener, we can see higher sodium. Most of those are salt-based softeners. We'll see higher sodium if we haven't done something about it. So what you have to do ahead of testing is ideally, you know about your water quality and you've established some kind of filtration. If not though, what you can do is either an apple cider vinegar rinse to remove some sediment off the hair follicles themselves or rinse at the end of the shower with distilled water a couple of times before you collect a sample, um, which would be the lowest cost route if we don't have filtration established. Oh, that's awesome to know. Cause yeah, I, I wouldn't have thought about that. Honestly. Um, it seems so simple to think about, but in my brain, you know, uh, but I've heard, <laughs> you know, I've heard from folks and, and so, especially with the apple cider vinegar rinse, you know, and, and stripping things off the hair, I definitely have heard of that. Now, you know, I, I know this, this you didn't intend to talk about testing this whole podcast. <laughs> I just find it fun because it's one of the things I get the most questions about. And I think that a lot of people have beat up the hair mineral tissue mineral yeah. analysis. And so I think it's important to kind of hear, you know, how we can debunk some of the things that people say with yeah. like, oh, well, you if you perm or dye your hair, you can't use it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, I, I don't know about that. Tell us about hair, like perm, oh, yeah. straightening, all the treatment stuff. Yes. So we do ideally want to get hair that is not treated. Um, so the way that we handle this with our clients is if you color treat or perm or any chemical process on your hair, we need to give about six months or sorry, six weeks of growth before we collect a sample. We're really looking at like the inch and a half closest to the scalp. It's not the whole strand of hair. We don't need to wait for that to fully grow out. Um, but we do want to make sure that we're minimizing that um, false, it would usually be like heavy metals that would show up interestingly if the dyes oh. or chemicals were present. Um, and so we'll wait six weeks, six to eight weeks post treatment. We try to catch it ahead of time. It's like, Hey, if you're going in for a hair appointment, actually you could have your hairdresser cut the sample for you before they proceed with the treatment on your hair. Um, but every now and then we miss that and somebody's just dyed their hair and we have to wait, you know, and it's okay. We can still start with basic mineral stuff while we wait. Um, so what's nice about mineral work is it's pretty, pretty low risk, high reward type stuff. Oh, that's huge. That's huge. Yeah. And I think it's something to be thinking about for a lot of folks that, you know, we, I mean, obviously you're testing, not guessing, but when we can't, <laughs> you know, something easy to start working forward with now, you know, I think a lot of people might be thinking, okay, we've talked about periods and things like that. What about for ladies that aren't getting their periods anymore? What happens in perimenopause and minerals and vitamins and things of that nature? What have you yeah. been seeing in trends there? Yeah. So we don't serve menopausal clients very often in our client, in our practice, but I have a lot of colleagues that do. And we talk about this all the time because it's really interesting. And when we transition into menopause, one of the first things that happens is the adrenal glands are going to take up some of the job of hormone production with the idea that maybe this would ease the transition. But we've been hinting at the fact that the last several decades have been really taxing, whether we've just been eating in a way that doesn't support us, exercising in a way that doesn't support us, or the nutrition has just been subpar, or maybe we had things like birth control in the mix contributing to that depletion. So in a menopausal client, we typically see really depleted adrenals from a mineral perspective because now they're getting kicked while they're down. You know, they were already struggling during our cycling years and now they've got more workload, still haven't been repleted. So we see that kind of pattern too. We see a lot of the same calcium to potassium imbalances with thyroid function. Um, nothing too new from a strictly mineral perspective, but now the state of the adrenal function is even more important in that season of life. Yeah. How much stress someone has either had externally or created internally definitely I think is a, a big factor as to how the trajectory goes for us. So mm -hmm. I'm gathering that, you know, from, from what we talked about before we hit record, now you've got your your one-on-one -on -one and mm -hmm. you've got a group program that's that you've got, I saw on the website there. I think a lot of people might be like, okay, all right, how does this work? How can we get testing and get mm -hmm. some support? Or can we do testing and do the DIY course and be able to sort mm -hmm. of figure it out ourselves? I'm always going to go for the one-on-one -on -one or some support, yeah. but 
just so we cover all the thought <laughs> processes that may be going on with folks. Yeah. So I, I also am the biggest fan of, of one-on-one and where I think functional testing and even functional medicine as a whole can get a bad reputation is when people spend a lot of money on testing and they didn't get the follow through. There wasn't a great interpretation and there wasn't an action plan built off of it. And tests by themselves will solve nothing. They might actually just add some confusion and then we've spent money. (laughs) So having it, like if you're going to embark on this journey, you want to learn about your physiology and be walked through a process of really optimizing the way that you eat, move and live based on that. um, You really want to be paired with somebody that knows what they're doing with the testing that you're spending money on. And I think a one-on-one relationship is the most potent for transformations. But we do also have a, a course which essentially takes you know the framework of our one-on-one and lays it out in a self-paced format because we wanted to be able to reach those that either um, you know financially can't afford one-on-one work at the time and want a place to start, or maybe their symptoms aren't severe enough to warrant that kind of a deep dive, but they want to be proactive. Mm-hmm. Um, so we don't do testing inside the context of the course. Okay. We really just do it with our one-on-one clients because um, I'm very protective of if we're going to spend time, money, and effort on testing, we need to have the the container where we can really use that effectively. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know how many times people have brought me tests <laughs> yes. from docs and they're like, yeah, my my doc ran it, but didn't know what, how, you know, and, and sometimes it's because the person requested it and just needed someone to order it, you yeah. know, and so no fault of the doctors, but I have had other situations in which it was run and then there wasn't really interpretation. And and that is sad. It, it's hard. And, and, you know, I think the other side of it and, and one of the areas that I find hard is, is that if you're seeing a doc who still has a very busy practice doing insurance, you know, heavy, mm-hmm. heavy on that. And that's where I'm coming out of right now it's hard to do the one-on-one that people need yeah, to, to support the background and a lot gets missed there. So I see that you have yourself, but you also have some other colleagues that help you out. You have a yep. team. Yes, which is amazing. It was not always that way. <laughs> and we can definitely serve people better now. Yeah, yeah. And so d- if folks are like, wanting to work with you specifically, can that be requested? I, you know, because usually people hear a podcast and they'll be mm-hmm. like, can I work with you? Yeah. Um, so we actually do something a little bit unique in our practice. We have a collaborative care model, which oh. we started at the start of 2023, which means that if you're a client in the practice, you actually interface with more than one of us during our time together. And we do that on purpose because the types of women that are drawn to our practice are not brand new to working on their health. They usually have been pretty immersed. They're listening to a lot of podcasts. They've maybe seen other providers Um, They've done a lot of trial and error, and we just want to make sure things don't get missed. And I love having multiple brains on the case. So we round as a team every week, we go through, you know, the client caseload, and then we're able to assign different practitioners for different sessions based on what's coming up, whose skill set is a really good fit for that. Um, So it's actually all four of us that are involved in client care, um, which is really fun. That's cool. That's cool. I like that approach. I mean, I personally like working as a team too. And so I've been solo yeah. for a while and it's mm-hmm. kind of, it's kind of sad. I, I miss it. I, I like the more brains um, yeah. in, in the mix. Now, of course, one of the other things um, that I always ask about is athletes mm-hmm. and yeah. specific dialing in. Cause I saw you guys work with exercise and things of that nature. How are you tailoring kind of nutrient needs and, and fitness? What What is your program there? Kind of how do you guys approach that? Yeah. So none of the four of us have any kind of formal certification in the exercise space. At one point I had a personal training cert many years ago, but it has lapsed. So we don't prescribe specific training, you know, within our program, but we can help advise on what might be most appropriate based on current health presentation, any lab data that we might have. Um, What's pretty common for our clients is that the volume or intensity of their training is exceeding their level of recovery from food and sleep and even minerals. Um, And then if we know that they're active, either an athlete or just an active individual, and we know that, you know, sweating is increased, metabolic demands on the body are increased, we can be a little bit more aggressive with that mineral support that we do right out of the gates, knowing that their needs are higher. So we really are more consultants on exercise and how it fits within the context of their care. Um, We might connect them to other programs or um, apps that might be appropriate for them. But we have a lot of very high stress clients 
very nutrient deplete clients doing really intense training. Um, so it's a lot of conversation around how is this appropriate? Is this, is this really a way that we can alleviate stress or are we adding stress back with the style of training, which I was a hundred percent guilty of for many years too. <laughs> I hear you on that. I hear you on that. <laughs> So as with most podcasts, I always like to ask questions a little bit more personal about your, you know, kind of your business, your your jam, what you're enjoying. And so I always, you know, with with nutrition, I always co- go down the route of like, all right, what if, if you were on a stranded, like stranded on an island, what three foods would you bring with you and why? And and guys, I didn't give her any <laughs> any premise on this. I'm going to talk a little bit and let her think over a couple of things um, okay. for for this. But yeah, I always kind of ask nutritionists like, because I want to know, like, what are you thinking about and and why? Because obviously we're all different. And, and when we're thinking about ourselves, I, I like to hear the thought process as to how you'd support yeah. yourself with the three things you bring on that island. Okay. I uh, actually, this is not too difficult. I know exactly what I would bring. With me. Awesome. <laughs> I would bring great steaks, like I just feel really good and really nourished when I'm eating quality animal proteins. So I know without that, I wouldn't feel as good. Um, I would bring milk, which is a random one to an Island in a hot climate, but I, that's such a staple in my diet. It's carbs, proteins, and fats together. We get a lot of nourishment from that. You can do a lot with that. It's very satiating. And then I would bring, I was deciding between some kind of fruit or honey, but I'll just go with honey for the time being. Like I want that carb. I want that energy. Um, I enjoy the taste of it. I think I could do a lot with the three of those things and not get super sick of stuff. (laughs) Awesome. And we'll figure out logistics later in terms of how we're going (laughs) to cool things and everything. But no, that's great because, you know, I think a lot of people wonder like why right? Why, why, why do we love the things we love and, and recommend the things that we do? And we're all individual, but you know, dairy's an interesting one and it's been mm-hmm. beat up yeah. for years, years. Mm-hmm. So give us, give us your take on dairy for yeah. you, for clients, you know, what, if, what's your yeah ballpark statement there? Yeah. I'll be curious to know where you land on this too, knowing that you live on a farm, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, I was I was like full in the almond milk cult for a for a long time. I was eating mm-hmm. almond everything for a long time too. Um, not coincidentally, that was when I was not feeling great either. But I also had some like dairy fears because I didn't do great with dairy. I remember having some bloating or digestive issues with it, and I would get um, like skin breakouts when I had dairy. And so I, you know, kind of stumbled deep down like Weston A. Price type rabbit holes over the years and really learned that there's a big difference between like commercially available dairy and like actual dairy that hasn't been manipulated. So I'm a big fan and proponent of well-sourced raw milk because I think it is so nutrient dense, um, generally really well tolerated, even in folks that haven't done well with pasteurized dairy before. And I think can be a really helpful component of the diet. I don't think everybody can do great with dairy, maybe not right out of the gates. Um, but if we've got a digestive tract that's working well and we've got good digestive enzymes, I think it can be really a supportive food. I I agree. I absolutely agree with that. And it's it comes down to, and yes, I live in Wisconsin. So you guys can take it for what it's worth here. Um, there are not many raw dairy farms here. It's yeah. just not, it's, and there aren't in the world, you know, I don't know about the world, but in the United States, they're not because it was illegal for so long. Right. But I have found the same thing. If I have raw anything, I'm good. But mm-hmm. if I get pasteurized, I am not good. And yeah. I am worse with yeah. coconut almond, you know, all the like, yeah. not the almond or the coconut in a can, but the other stuff, like it's, yeah, it's mind blowing. And, and I think this is where we're missing out, especially when we go back to that calcium, potassium, Mm-hmm. balance business and, and the thyroid stuff. Yeah. I think it's a biggie. I'm glad you shared that. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad we're aligned. You never know how that's going to go over. That's a very polarizing topic for some reason. It is until someone steps out and actually does a test. You mm-hmm. have to test yourself. Yeah. Like, I feel like, you know, it, it goes different ways. And, and unfortunately when people are, are outwardly spoken about that, I'm like, why don't you try it yourself first and then tell me what you think? Yeah. Because... I'm really glad you mentioned that because that fear around experimenting is a really big issue with nutrition. 
And you're never going to know how things land for you unless you start trying some things. And it's okay for it not to be perfect at first. But that's such a miss, I think, that has happened in the nutrition space over the years is feeling like we have to seek somebody else's rules in order to know that what we're doing is healthy, even if we're following those rules and we don't feel good. So just normalizing that experimentation and everybody's different. Why don't you go try it and see how it works for you? And if it works great, if it doesn't, that's fine too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we have too many rules. We have too many gurus out there that like, this is the only way carnivore is <laughs> the only way this way. Yeah. I mean, I'm like, Oh Lord, you know. know, people come into me and you probably heard it. Like they'll come out with diets and you're like, I've not heard of that. I know <laughs> you're doing what I should have. <laughs> Like the latest one for me was the dirty fast that I was like, you're not That's eating new to me. organic. I don't, I don't explain <laughs> this. What's a dirty fast. You like, you didn't take a shower. I don't know. You know, and, and the lingo is the lingo's out of control, but it's definitely funny when we get down to that. And I, you know, as, as humans, of course, we're looking for guidance. We're looking for the quick fix, but I I'm gathering that you're also similar in this case where we have the fix. We yeah. just have to experiment and be willing yeah. to try things out. Yeah, sure. I know. The body's so smart. It's always te- uh, speaking to you and letting you know what it needs. I just think, I think where getting some initial guidance is helpful is if we've had years or decades of suppressing the signs from the body, it can take some time and some expert help to get back in touch with that and get a roadmap to start with. But ultimately that long-term path to freedom is knowing how to take that input from your own body and adjust accordingly. And then you don't need anybody else's rules. And then you're not constantly consuming so much content that's conflicting and being stuck in the middle. And that's really my wish for anybody that we ever serve is that they feel the freedom that comes from knowing how to take care of themselves in really any season that might come up. <clears throat> Super important. I, I wholeheartedly agree. Now, of course, I want to round the podcast out again because I, I did that one and then we, we just are going to keep going. Okay. So you have a chihuahua. <laughs> yes. I, I love dogs. And I have dabbled in my head with the experiment of using my dog's hair and seeing oh. what he's, if he's deficient in at all. Mm-hmm. Have you done that if I've, at all? You know, I haven't, but it's a brilliant idea and maybe I will. Why not? I love, I love him. He's currently asleep in my office. Like he is for the entire work day. <laughs> um, that would be really, really interesting to see. And I'm fairly certain that Trace Elements does do animal panels. Like I think there's some vet applications of HTMA testing, which is really cool. Ooh, good to know. Cause yeah, I'm like my, he's right here. Um, My golden retriever. I'm like, I want to know. Cause, cause we feed him raw, raw foods. And, and yeah. so I'm like, I wonder what, what he's missing out. Cause I'm like constantly doing like my little, like what I read in the book, right. The yeah. forever dog. I'm like, well, I'm just, I just read this and I'm like, I'm treating him no different than, than... <laughs> <laughs> like we got a test. Don't guess on these dogs too. <laughs> what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. Oh my goodness. You know, I would love to hear if you did that. I'm going to check out trace, trace minerals guys. If you got pets that you want to know what's up with them. I, yeah. I think we look and see what's going on there too. And obviously yeah. now we have gone from women's health to pet health, but us ladies, we love our dogs and our cats mm-hmm. and our critters. So yeah. it is what it is. <laughs> so Kaylee, tell us how we can find you online, how folks can hook up with you, how folks can find out if you guys are going to be a good fit for them. Give us a scoop. Yeah. So you can find me mostly on Instagram. I only have the bandwidth for one social media platform. So that's the only place. And it's Kaylee RD. And my name is spelled weird. It's K-A-E-L-Y R-D. And then my website is the same, kaleyrd.com. But you'll find a lot of you know, free educational resources. You'll find info about the different ways my team and I can support you and can help you figure out what makes the most sense based on what it is you're working on. Makes sense. And you've got a quiz. We, we yep. don't want to skip over the Find Your Magic quiz because yes. I was thinking that that would be a great way for folks to dabble too. It's definitely a great way. And it can help uh, lead you toward whatever resources are most applicable. We made this because we all grew up loving the like Cosmo magazine style quizzes, you know, like Mm. everybody loves a personality type quiz. So it's fun, but it also does ask you some questions about main symptoms and goals so that we can make sure we're sending relevant info to you and connecting you to ways that we can help that would make an impact. So it's a fun, it's a really fun quiz. We had it in the works for a long time and it finally exists. So Enjoy that. 
Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to have to take that. You guys, I, I highly recommend you guys check it out. And then we will put all the notes in drjcrossnd.com for everybody so they can look up the test names and all the things. So if you guys forgot what we said, it's okay. Head over to the website. We'll we'll take care of you there. Kaylee, thanks so much for coming on. What a great conversation. I look forward to hearing what happens if you decide to do the, the Chihuahua testing. <laughs> and I will let yes. you know about the golden retriever over here. Please do. And thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. Oh, my pleasure. Hey, fellow health junkie, thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.